Hello and welcome to the Farbank Fly Fishing School. I'm your host, Simon Gorsworth, and in this episode, we're going to talk about river fly fishing tactics. We're going to look at how to find fish in the river, how to read a river, how to fish a river, and some of the gear you need to go fly fishing in a river with success. Before we go into how to fly fish a river, let's just run through a couple of things that are really important to start off with. Your safety is one of them. So wear a hat when you're fishing. Far easier to take a hook out of your hat than your head. Wear some kind of eye protection over your eyes. Definitely, definitely don't want a hook in your eyes. And I would recommend you get polarized sunglasses, right? Because polarized, that's a form of lens that cuts light out at a certain angle and makes you see through the water, cuts out the glare, because a lot of fly fishing for trout is gonna be seeing things, seeing fish, seeing bugs underwater. So polarized glasses are a big boon to you as a fly fisherman on the river. And then I would recommend, certainly if you're a complete novice and if you're going down perhaps with a family and you're all just starting off fly fishing, I would re recommend either fishing a fly that has no barb on, you can actually buy flies with no barbs on, or taking a pair of hemostats, forceps, whatever you want, and just crimping down the barb so it's a flattened barb. And it's just easier to take out of your clothes, out of your skin, out of, out of a fish. If you get into fly fishing, you're gonna find a stage in time where you'll probably be catch and releasing fish. Maybe they're too small, or maybe you just want to catch and release fish. And in those conditions, it's far safer and better for the fish if you fish a barbless hook. So crimp the fly down or get barbless flies, and that makes it easier to unhook and return that fish safely. One other thing you wanna do before you go fishing is you wanna make sure you've got an appropriate fishing license. We're in Montana right now. This is my Montana fishing license. You've got to have your state license. You've got to make sure you got it for the right year. You want to fish legally. That's really, really important. You kind of also want to check the regulations. Like you're allowed two flies here in Montana. In Idaho, you can fish three or four or five flies, right? So check the regulations. Know what you're allowed to fish. Know the seasons for the fish you're allowed to catch. But also, you want to make sure you're fishing legally and you've got permission to fish on that water that you're fishing. You're not going to get caught and nicked for poaching. That wouldn't be a good start to your river fishing career. So those are your kind of your preambles, your pre-flight safety checks, if you like. And then once you've got those done, you're dialed in, you're confident, of, you know the regulations and you've got your license, you're going to go down to the river and start fly fishing. But before we do that, let's discuss rivers. Let's work out, let's talk about what a river is and how that significance of a river and a current influences where trout lie and what their behavior is. Now, before you arrive at the river, it's worth understanding what a river is. A river is a body of water that moves downhill. Generally speaking, it creates this thing called current. Current flows this way, downhill most of the time. And what's significant about the current is how trout behave in current. Current brings to them Oxygen, they like to face into the current because water goes in their mouth, comes out of their gills. So they always face into the current direction. But current also brings them food. So a trout can lie here and just kind of be fat Larry waiting. And here comes a bug, wrong. And here comes another bug. And it can just take up a station on the water that basically the current, the oxygen, the food is all brought to them by the current. And that's what makes river fishing pretty interesting because river fish usually fee face into the current and have what's called a station or a lie, depending what you're, where you're from. But that means that they have a base where they stay unless they're scared off by people or otters or something, water height changes. And that base, they'll stay for ages and ages, hours and hours and hours in that same spot. And they have chosen that spot because everything, all their requirements are brought to them by the current. Very different from a lake. Lake trout move around looking for food, getting oxygen into them. River trout have this station. And that what makes it particularly easy to look at a river and work out, yes, there's going to be a fish there. There's never going to be a fish there. And a trout has three requirements, oxygen, safety, food. Oxygen is bought by the current. Generally, food is bought by the current, though they can kind of eat off the bottom. And the safety, that's a really big one. The bigger the trout, the more secure the location they'll be. So the big trout will have like the palaces underwater that have the best food, the best cover, the best oxygen. Content. Everything they want is brought to them by the current and they've chosen this spot. And anything that's little that tries to have that spot, they chase out. And the medium trout will have good digs, you know, a decent accommodation, kind of a, not quite a palace, but maybe a mansion. And then this little trout might have a little cottage and the tiny baby fry will have a hovel. They're just living in a 
the, the water that hasn't got anything. So there's a hierarchy in fish and they choose their lies based on that hierarchy. So it's really good to understand kind of what their requirements are. And as I said, always bear in mind that they, that they need oxygen and food and they want some cover. So when you look at a river, a river, you can break a river down, you can take a little photo or you can stand on the river bank and look at different things, different features, the terminology of a river. One of them is called a back eddy. And a back eddy is a very obvious one. It's where the current goes down and something has created a swirl where the current goes the opposite direction. That's called a back eddy. And in those conditions, trout will still face the current, but they won't face upstream. Right? If the river's going down this way and a back eddy makes my current go that way, the trout will face this way. It'll face always, it'll face into the current rather than upstream. Right? So just bear that in mind if you find a back eddy. So that's one thing you look for. You're also looking for what's called a seam. A seam is a lovely thing. A seam is where there are current with two currents with different speeds. You might have a slow current here and a fast current there. And that current line between the two is the seam. It's the edge of two speeds of current. That's a great one. Fish like to lie in the slower current because they don't have to work so hard. But the faster current brings more food and more oxygen in the given time to them. So they'll lie on the edges of these seams. And in a similar note, there's a thing called a funnel or a bubble line. And imagine a bit of river this wide that for whatever reason tapers into a piece this wide. So all the food between this hand and this hand is pushed into this one little channel. Wonderful spot for a big fish. You won't get little guys there. That'll be a big fish taking prime spot there. And bubble lines are a similar thing. It's where currents are pushed together by rocks or sticks or banks that, that push the water together and create this line of bubbles. So you're looking for lines of bubbles. You want to observe the depth. Shallow water will hold small fish. Deeper water will hold big fish. Those are all good things. You want to look at for overhanging banks, banks that are high and steep and have got a little undercut next to them. What a great place for fish to hide. In other words, a river isn't just a bit of current. A river has numerous features. And as you get into fly fishing, you start to un understand where you're catching fish. You're going to work out where those little guys lie and where those medium guys lie and where the big guys lie and where nothing lies. And you concentrate your fishing techniques based on how you read the river. There are numerous fish that live in rivers. Trout require clean rivers, cooler temperatures, cooler waters, lots of food. Carp can live in rivers. They don't need such cool water. They can live in warm water that's a bit slower. There's bass that live in rivers. There's pike that live in rivers. There's great, there's numerous species you can catch fly fishing. But we're just gonna concentrate this episode on the, what we call the game fish, trout. And in addition to trout, there's a couple of kind of mini game fish that some people like to catch, but usually aren't considered trout. And we'll just talk about those. So the, the type of trout you're likely to catch is a, what's called a rainbow trout. There's a brown trout. There's a cutthroat trout. There's a brook trout. And there's a whitefish. And those are the ones we're going to talk about. There's also a grayling. Maybe we'll touch on that. And, and really, let's look at how to identify them. Because if you're out fishing the river for the first time and you catch a fish, it's kind of good to know what you've caught so you can tell your buddies, hey, I caught a, a rainbow trout. So rainbow trout, they're usually fairly fast growing. They, they reach maturity in three to four years, get very quickly get big. They're usually quite a, a silvery color on the side with a lovely magenta purpley hue on its flanks. That's what you're looking for, that magenta hue with kind of a silvery section to the belly to the lower half. The back of a rainbow is usually a bit darker. Rainbow trout usually have kind of more of a black freckle rather than a, a round spot, as you would call a spot. And you're looking for freckles. When you look at the tail of a rainbow trout, there's going to be freckles on the tail as well and on the dorsal fin. So what you're looking for for a rainbow trout, which is one of the commonest species you're likely to catch, are kind of silvery flanks with a magenta, slightly purplish sides on, the, on, its, on its two flanks. Freckles on the tail is a really good one to look at because uh, some trout don't have any freckles on the tail and, and freckles kind of small black spots on the fins. That's what a rainbow trout is. Now, a similar fish to a rainbow trout, a cousin to the rainbow trout, is called the cutthroat. Cutthroat trout look like rainbows to a lot of people. There are a number of subtleties that make them not rainbow trout. And with all these fish, remember there are a ton of subspecies. There's a ton of rainbows. You can get blue rainbows and golden rainbows and things like that. But we're just going to talk about the basic rainbows. 
And cutthroat are the, the same. There's a numerous strains of cutthroat, but generally a golden rule with your cutthroat is they're gonna look similar to rainbows, but the flanks are gonna be less silvery. They're a little bit more goldenish, but above all the giveaway is what the trout's name is, a cutthroat. When you look underneath the chin on the trout, the bottom of its mouth, you'll find that the underneath has two little orange sections right under its kind of chin. And those orange sections are the giveaway that that is a cutthroat trout. The next common trout you'll find is a brown trout. Brown trout are notorious. A lot of people love the brown trout. They, they are aggressive when it's spawning time. They're a beautiful color. They're very golden flanks. Unlike the rainbows that have that silvery flank, they have round spots rather than freckles. Almost, almost never does a brown trout have a spot on the tail. They're usually clear tails, there's nothing small. So if you're in doubt, look at the tail. Some brown trout have red spots, big round red spots. But again, look for the roundness of the spot rather than a freckle thing and look for these golden flanks. The brook trout, that's another trout. You get a lot of that on the East Coast. You get a lot of those on smaller creeks. Brook trout are a, just a jewel, just a beautiful, beautiful trout. They, they have whites and oranges and yellows spots. They have a kind of a, a greenish, dark greenish body section of flanks to the thing rather than the silvers of rainbows and the golden of browns. They are generally smaller brook trout. They don't grow as big as the rainbows and browns. Um, but again, there are species you want to watch out for. Just look at the beautiful size of this brook trout here. This is a classic brook trout. And then what you might find as sides to those trout, you might catch a thing called a whitefish and you might catch a thing called a grayling depending where you're fishing. Whitefish are just basically silvery. There's no spots on them. Well, a few little tiny black spots and freckles, but really there's no pronounced spots. There's no pronounced color change. But what they do have, they have a top lip that extends over the bottom lip, which makes them different from trout. Trout lips kind of level, top and bottom lips are level. But whitefish have a, lips, a top lip that over hangs the bottom lip, and that's because they feed on the bottom a lot, and they want that top lip like a little suction filter on the mud. And then the other one you look at, occasionally catch, and personally I'm a big fan of is a grayling. Very similar to a whitefish in that it's going to be silvery, it's going to have a little few black spots, it's got a top overhanging lip to it, but it has this enormous dorsal fin that's like a sail that really pronounces and sits up in the current or sits up when you land the thing. And, and the grayling are really easy to identify by looking at the size of this dorsal fin. So really, that's it. These little images here show you all the fish options and you're likely to catch in a river. And it's a good thing to know, kind of get an understanding of what you're likely to catch, what they look like, as I said. So when you're down there and you catch one, you can tell your buddy just what you've caught. Now the real difference between a novice angler and a good angler is the ability to read the river. That's what it's called. And that is where you study the river and you deduce where there's a fish and where there isn't a fish, and where there's a little fish and where there's a big fish. And as your skills grow, you'll start to make these deductions naturally. You'll just look at a river and go, there's no fish there, no, there'll be little fish, there'll be big fish. So we talked a little bit earlier just now about the, the, the structure, the different terminologies, the different parts, and all that plays into the role of reading the river. You want to think like a fish. Where is the fish going to get that oxygen? Where is the fish going to get its food? Remember, the food is brought to him by the current. And where is the fish going to feel safe? So here we're going to show you just a few clips of some great areas where trout are going to be lying and where you look for big fish and where you're likely to find no fish and where you're going to find little fish. Let's start with no fish because this is a good place to avoid. And you can see right here, we're looking at a bit of water that's skinny. It's flowing really, really fast. There's no break in the water. There's no seam, as I talked about. There's no funnel. There's really no bubble line. There's no depth. There's no nothing. It's just really shallow, fast-flowing water. And it's almost certain that nothing's lying in it. The water looks like three inches deep, and therefore, there's almost nothing going to be lying in there. If there is, they're going to be very, very small, and they'll soon be eaten by ospreys and birds above. That's the kind of place to avoid. Now, as we start to look at better bits of water, you can see this bit of water here deepens off. You can see the color gets a little bit darker. That color is a great thing. The visual color change is an amazing thing to look at because generally speaking, as water gets deeper, it gets a little more of a darker hue to it. So when you're looking at the two bits of water, you can see here we have a little bit shallow water because it's easy to see and clear. 
and you can see the bottom very brightly, and here you can see that the water's a little bit darker, and that indicates there's what's called a drop-off. There's a change in depth there, because we can see light colour and we can see dark colour, and that drop-off is an excellent place for fish. They like to lie on the edge of that. Now, we're going to look at some cover situations. Cover situations come from the bank itself, right? All the rivers have the banks on either side. And a lot of the river undercuts the bank. The current undercuts and creates these deep cutoffs. And here you can see there's a lot of grass overhanging the river and there's a deeper, darker color there. And what's even better about this spot is you can see there's a current seam coming off the edge. So you have got a bit of fast water bringing food down You've got a nice little edge of slow water where the fish can lie. You've got a depth because you can tell by the color of the water, the, the darker hue, and you've got this lovely overhanging bank where the fish will be lying and can dart under to get cover from anything that scares it. So this is a spot you're gonna look for for trying to find a big trout. Another spot, look at this one here. This is a beautiful spring creek. You can see there's loads and loads of weeds there. The little fish will be lying on top of the weeds because they're little fish, they don't have the prime lies. The little fish, because they're on top of the weed, they're likely to get caught by birds. They can't go deeper than that because then they can't see the food being brought to them. Whereas right here, you've got this lovely pocket, and this is a little sandy pocket. You can see there's a gap in the weeds, and in this gap in the weeds, that's where you're going to find a nice sized trout. This trout can see everything coming towards it, but it can lie deeper than those little trout in the shallow stuff above the weed, so it's got the safety of depth. It's got the visual acuity of the food coming down because there's no weeds around its face and it's got that weed to bolt into. So really that's what reading a river is, is you start to analyze every bit of water you want and you get to, and you kind of just deduce, give them a, a, a rating, give them a mark, like 0% because there's no chance of a fish, 100% because the world's biggest trout is gonna be lie there and just fish the water where you have the higher percentage marks. So look for the current, look for the structure. Remember, fish need the food, fish need the oxygen, and fish need the safety. And when you find those, the better those three are, the bigger your fish are gonna be. Now, there's so many rivers around the world that you're likely to fish, from little ones to big ones, and you're gonna to need to tailor your gear to fish those rivers. And we covered in an earlier episode, pretty detailed gear. So I'm not going to delve into gear in any capacity here, but I just want to touch on some key considerations as a river angler that are worth keeping in mind. And the first consideration is your outfit, your rod, reel and line. And what I have here is a nine foot five weight. And a nine foot five weight is probably your just go-to outfit for pretty well everything. I've got a nine foot rod with a five weight line. And on here, I've got a five weight reel with a five weight line on. And that's probably just your best for everything. If you're gonna fish all the techniques we're about to look at, just on medium to large size rivers, you're not gonna go far wrong with a nine foot five weight. But every now and then you're gonna find, maybe you live in an area where there's smaller rivers or maybe you wanna get away from the crowds and go up and hike up some mountains and get away from the people, get to some smaller rivers. Every now and then you're gonna fish much smaller rivers. And in smaller rivers, you have a lot less space. You're confined by trees on either side. You can't cast as far as a result. Overhanging trees are gonna snag the line. And so for small creeks and small rivers, you generally want to go down to a much smaller outfit. Look at this little wand. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So this one, this is a four piece rod that's six foot 10 inches, quite a bit shorter than my nine footer. This is for a four weight line. So I like to go down a little bit lighter in line size because I don't need to cast far. Fish are generally a little bit smaller. And on the end of that, I'm gonna put a four weight line and a four weight reel just to round out and balance it. So for smaller rivers, you probably do need to step down and not get the nine foot five weight, but get something like this shorter rod that takes a lighter line. And then the only other consideration probably for, for you as a trout river angler or as a future trout river angler is that there is a technique when, which we're going to look at very, very shortly, I promise you, on fishing streamers. Streamers are just big things. They're colorful, they're bright, they're an addiction for fishing because the grabs, when a fish hits these, these hit, they hit them hard. You get a lot of big fish on these things because these, these are large prey, so big fish eat them. And they are exhilarating ways to fish fishing a streamer. But as you can see from my selection here, streamers are quite large flies. And it's pretty hard to cast these large flies with a five weight. 
So if you're going to concentrate on streamer fishing, or maybe you've started fishing and now want to add the component of streamer fishing to your arsenal, you actually want to step up a rod size. And what I've got here, this is a six weight. This is a nine foot rod again, same length, but it's a little six weight. So it's a bit bigger in, than the five weight and the four weight. It takes a heavier line. That's what I got on here. I've got a much heavier line. And that heavier line is much better for throwing heavier flies. So really that's your kind of general outfit. Short for creeks, nine foot five weight for your all round, maybe a six weight for big streamers and throwing flies that are really large and difficult to cast. Now, the other part I want to just talk about briefly is the leader. Generally speaking, your go-to fishing leader for trout rivers is going to be nine foot, especially if you're going to fish a single fly. This is a 5X and, an, no, this is a 6X, but nine foot 5X, nine foot 6X, nine foot 4X. That's a perfect size leader for, again, pretty well everything. Nine foot, good all round length, four, five and 6X, great range of sizes for most things you're going to do. If you're fishing those small creeks, you, the nine foot leader is just gonna to be too long. You're gonna be casting away and the leader is so long you can't get any fly line outside the rod. So when you fish smaller rivers, you gotta have, have shorter and shorter leaders. This is a little seven and a half footer. This is four X, but again, for small creeks, I would have some seven and a half foot four X, five X and six X. That's a great selection of leaders for those smaller rivers that you might be fishing. And that last outfit I talked about, the streamers on the six weight, I would go down to a really short leader. One thing that's very, very important about casting heavy flies is the fly has to be close to the fly line. The closer the fly is to the fly line, the easier the weight of the fly line turns over the weight of the fly. So when you're fishing big flies and big streamers, you actually want to fish a much shorter leader and a much heavier, stronger, stiffer leader. No 4X, 5X, 6X, more like 1X or 0X or 10 pounds or 12 pounds. So much, much stronger, much shorter leaders. And that will make casting streamers a lot easier for you. And then talking of streamers and flies, you can kind of see that as you evolve through fishing, we've already looked at my streamer box, as, we, as you evolve through fishing, you're gonna find you build up selections. This is my streamer selection, which I just showed you there. When I fish dry flies, I love hunting rising fish and heads, so I have a selection of dry flies. And you can see with this selection of dry flies, I've gone from tiny little things up to giant ones. I've gone from grays to cream colors to browns to yellows to purples. I've got a selection of sizes. I've got a selection of colors. I've got a selection of the way they float, which is technical stuff, but I've got a selection. So this is a good dry fly selection. And nymphs are the same. If I'm a nymph mood and I want to go nymphing, I'm going to fit pull out my nymph box, this is a selection of nymphs, just beautiful colors, I love this array of colors and stuff like that. And again, just a selection of sizes, a selection of colors, that's just a nymph box. And perhaps one of my biggest addictions of all is swinging soft tackles. And so when I soft tackle, I've got a box full of my soft tackles. And soft tackles, type of fly, but again, there's a range here of big flies that are dull, big flies that are visible, small flies that are bright, dull little flies, weighted flies, just a selection. My point is that as you get into fly fishing, you're going to build up fly selections after fly selections. You're going to find out what bugs your local water has hatching. You're going to have those bugs. You're going to find out what flies the trout like. You're going to build up those selection of bugs. But starting off from the get-go, it's pretty hard to buy this much. You don't want to spend that kind of money. You don't really know what to buy. And so generally speaking, perhaps the best thing I could recommend to you if you're a novice fly fisher and want to go into rivers, is start off with what's called a basic trout assortment. And this is just Rio make this, a lot of companies have these, but these are basically just a selection of flies that cover the bases. So if I open this box up, you'll see what's in here. I've got a little streamer in here. I've got some foam terrestrial flies. I've got some dry flies. I've got a couple of nymphs. I've got a soft tackle in here. So this box has just a simple assortment of probably the most effective flies around the US, around the world to be fair. But if you go this route, don't buy one because if you hook a fish and you like a fly and then lose the fly, you don't have another. So if you're starting off, I'd highly recommend just start simple. Get an assortment of flies like that for your destination, trout, steelhead, whatever it is. Buy three or four boxes so you've got a few spares. Load up your box and then you are set and ready with all the gear you need to go and fly fish a river. A 
river angler should have this toolbox. And this toolbox has tools in it. And what we call, what I call tools are the casts. The type of cast you need to effectively fish a lot of river. The commonest cast is the overhead cast, the basic overhead cast. And in an earlier episode, I went through all of that, how to make a basic overhead cast. So I'm not gonna touch the overhead cast and tell you how to do it. In fact, I'm not gonna touch any of these casts telling you how to do them. I just wanna show you these casts so you've got added tools to your box to open up a bit more water. Here you can see Tommy, we're filming from the bridge. Tommy's standing in a nice lie down below the bridge, fishing upstream. He's got no obstructions behind him. He's got no obstructions in front of him. So he can make this basic overhead cast and lay the line down on the water, strip it in again, pick it up and repeat. That's, your, that's the essence of your overhead cast. In this situation, however, now we have a problem because now look where Tommy's standing, right behind him, there's a huge tree. So here, if he does an overhead cast, he's gonna snag his fly in that tree. And that's where a cast called a roll cast becomes an invaluable tool. And what he's got, he's got there's a cast has no back cast. The line doesn't go behind him. He just lifts the rod up, pitches it forward, and that's a cast called a roll cast. Very useful cast to know, and especially great when you've got obstructions behind you preventing you doing a regular overhead cast. In a completely different river, you might find something like this. Carly's fishing under this bridge. Beautiful run under the bridge, trout are under the bridge, or maybe they're under an overhanging tree. Either way, in some situations, you are gonna find that the overhead cast and the roll cast will fail because both of them have a vertical stroke that lays the line in a vertical plane, and both of them would snag the bridge or snag that overhanging tree. So what Carly's done here, she's turned her overhead cast onto the side and is making a casting stroke on the sideways plane. And what that does, look at that, puts the line right under the bridge, very easy to get under an overhanging tree or an overhanging bridge like that. So really those are your four tools. Those are the best tools to have in your box of casts before you get out on the river. As I said, I'm not going to go into them. I just want to show you these casts that as you evolve as a fly fisher, you're going to start to learn these casts and find out it opens up a pile more water to you because you know all these little casts that there are. And once you've cast your line out there and you've got it out to the fish, you're going to have to fish that. You're going to have to work out how to fish and catch a fish. And we're going to go right into that. And the first thing we're going to talk about in respect to that is what's called mending and feeding slack. It's just ways of, of controlling your line on the water. And with these tools, these tools will make you be able to fish a river with a high success rate. One of the things you'll soon learn about fishing, fly fishing, any kind of fishing, is that trout have instincts to survive. And what that means is they're pretty cautious of things that don't quite look right to them. And as a river angler, that can happen an awful lot of times. And it's usually down to the fact that your fly doesn't behave naturally in the water or naturally to what the fish wants. And so we're going to have a quick discussion about how to make your fly look natural in the water, and that is called mending and, and controlling slack. And what that means is, well, let's assume a fish is lying in the water, happily feeding away, and it's day after day it sees flies drifting over its face at a certain pace, and then the next fly that comes down drifts over its face at a completely different pace. It's not going to eat that because something's wrong with that. So when you're fishing a river, you've got these things called currents and you've got different current speeds. And what can happen when you create a cast across a current speed is you can get the current influencing the line in an adverse way. And here you can see exactly that. What we've got here is Tommy's casting across the current. He's got a bit of fast current in front of him and he's casting his fly into the slow water on the other side. And as you can see, as soon as the line lands, that fast bit of current is acting on the line and sweeping the fly out. So the fly that's landing in that slow water and should fish slowly is ripping out at an unnatural pace. That's a drag curve. That line that's landed in the water, the fast current has hit it, it's buckled it into a curve, the current is pushing on that curve and ripping the line out. That drag curve means your fly is fishing totally incorrectly and is going to be absolutely ignored by every single fish there is. So what do you do about that? You do what's called a mend you actually counteract that curve with the curve you put in yourself. And that is what a mend is. If you don't know what way to mend, first thing is make a little cast and watch what the current does to your line. If the line bends to your right, simply, you're gonna throw a mend to the left. If the mend, sorry, if the line lands and the current bends the line to the left, you're gonna throw a mend to the right. Here you can see he casts his line across. The line is going to push it to the right, downstream, so what he's doing is throwing a mend upstream. 
he's throwing a line against that to counteract that downstream current. That's an upstream end. Now, here's a different situation. Tommy's a little bit further into the water. He's casting across slow water into fast water. So his flies landed in that fast water, should drift naturally, but the slow water's holding it back. So in a situation like this, this is where you throw a man downstream, ahead of the fly, because the slow water is lagging it behind. So really, that's what mending is. Mending is you creating a curve in the line that is exact opposite of the curve that the current is creating to try and get as natural a drift as possible. Now, something that's really important with that is just some simple physics. And I'm gonna show you with this big, big bit of orange string that I've got here. And as everybody knows, the, unless you get into the time warp continuum thing, theories, whatever it is, the shortest distance between two objects is a straight line. So let's say I stand at position X. Whew. Cast my fly out to position Y. And there's a lovely trout feeding right here that I'm casting to the catch. And now I say, oh, the current's gonna affect my line, so I'm gonna throw a mend into it. If I throw a mend holding my end tight, that curve is gonna do something to the fly. Pull it a long way away from the fish. That's no good. You might have a great presentation of your fly, but it's nowhere near the fish. So what that means is that when you mend, you've got to do something to prevent that happening. And that something is you are going to give it slack. And if I do that same example with a rope and I've cast here, if the slack comes from this end, my end, you can see whoosh, the fly stays where it is. So when you mend, you've got to have a little bit of slack. We're going to see Tommy demonstrating both the right way and the wrong way. As you see here, he's holding the line in his left hand, the rod's in his right hand, he makes the cast, He's dropped the line out of his left hand. He's made this mend. He's lifted the rod up and made a sharp flick to the side. And the slack has come from him. And what that means is the fly has stayed where it landed. Perfect. It's in the position. The line's landed right. It's adjusted correctly. The fly stayed where it was. That's an excellent mend. Now let's take a look at the wrong way. And here, which a lot of people do, he's held the line tight and then made the mend without giving any slack from his end. And as a result of that, the fly, look at that, that fly has come so far out of the water, it landed in the slow, and now the line's in the fast water. He's dragged it out away from the fish, which is a totally useless mend. So do make sure that when you throw these mends into the line, which are just lifts and curves of your rod, when you throw these mends, you preempt your mend by releasing tension and then mending, and that will hold your fly in the right place. And the last little thing to talk about on the mend is an effective mend. You want the mend, let's go back to my little bit of rope here a second and show you. I want the mend to be exactly where the current is going to influence it. So if my current is fast here, buckling the line this way, my effective mend is going to be right here, right opposite where that current was pushing it. That's what I'm trying to achieve. So I want to make sure I throw the mend where the current's going to do it. And a bad mend, I might land my line here and throw the mend at this end, which is going to have no effect on where it should be. And as you can see, Tommy's going to demonstrate these. Here, he's lifting the rod high. A high rod of the lift clears a lot of line on the water and allows that mend to go further away from him. This is a good mend. So good mending technique, you want to make sure you lift the rod high, release the slack, throw a big mend into it, and that high lift gets the line clear from the water and allows that mend to be further away from you. If you do a nonchalant little flippy mend, because, hey, you saw a video about mending and it looked like a nonchalant little flip, you're going to find that the mend is in the wrong spot. Look at Tommy doing it now. He's not got any lift to the rod. He's done a little wiggly squiggly twitch of his rod tip. The mend has landed, but it's landed in the wrong spot. So mending is a skill. You've got to, first of all, analyze the water to see which way the current is going to make the line move. You've got to plan ahead, say, right, the current's going to move the line that way. Therefore, I've got to cast my mend that way. The current is going to move the mend 10 feet away from me, so I've got to create the mend 10 feet away from me, and I've got to give it slack to keep the fly in the place. It's a whole calculation process, but it's an essential skill to be a successful river angler. That's mending, and that's an integral part of your skills. And the other integral part of your skills is understanding how to control slack. We're going to take a look at that right now.
What I mean by controlling slack is that you're going to understand that your line has to do something, have to do something in a river. All their life, fish have been used to lying in their spot and bubbles and leaves and sticks and bugs go over them at the, whatever speed the current is. So they're used to it and they happily feed away on these. And then one day some foreign invasive thing happens and it lands and it goes at a radically different speed. It might look like what they're used to, but their natural instinct is to, oh, that's not right, leave it alone or even run away. So you've got to, in certain fishing situations, create a very natural drift of your fly that mimics bubbles, leaves, sticks, whatever's floating down and gets that same thing. Whether it's your fly or whether it's a bright orange little indicator, you want to have it drifting naturally. Now the easiest way to do that is to cast your line upstream against the current. Because the moment it lands, the current starts washing it towards you, so you get a pretty natural drift with it. That's pretty easy. That's a nice, easy, simple way of doing it. And we're going to look at Tommy here doing it the right way. And what I mean by the right way is that you can see when he lands the line down, he immediately drops his rod low and starts stripping the line in with his non-casting hand. And that stripping means you're maintaining tension. You're pulling line in. And the reason that's important is should a fish grab that fly, you've now got a straight line between your rod and that fly and can set the hook. Now he's going to do it wrong. Now he's going to cast upstream, the line lands, and he's stripping too slow, or maybe not even stripping at all. And what happens if you don't strip is the line passes your rod tip. The fly's still above you, but the line passes your rod tip, and under your rod, you have a great pile of slack. And then when you go to set the hook, you snatch and set the hook like that, well, nothing's there because all you're doing is lifting slack. You're not pulling the hook into the fish's mouth. So what that basically means is when you cast upstream, you want to get used to pulling the line in to keep in contact with the fly so you can set the hook when a fish does finally bite that fly. Now, kind of opposite thing to that is facing the other way, facing downstream, when the current's going away from you and you still want to create a natural drift. Again, we're going to look at Tommy. He's going to demonstrate the right way and the wrong way. And what you're looking for, whether it's a dry fly or a little bright orange indicator like this, is you want to make sure that drifts down at the exact same speed as the bubbles. Now to do that, what Tommy's doing here is you can see the lines in his left hand and his rod hand, he's just giving a little bounce and feeding a bit of slack out of his line, line hand. And every time he bounces his rod, a little bit of slack goes out and allows the indicator or the dry fly to drift naturally. Perfect. He's got enough tension to set the hook anytime, no bother, but he keeps bumping out slack. And as long as he's bumping out slack, that fly will drift naturally all the way down the river. So to get the natural drifts, you want to give slack when you're going downstream, and you want to retrieve when you're going upstream. Now we'll take a final look at Tommy doing it wrong. Here he's cast his line out. He's not feeding anything. The line's downstream of him. He's got the line tight in his hand, or maybe you can be feeding the line too slowly. But what's happening is now the current is going faster than the indicator, it's passing the indicator. And that means I've got drag, and that means that fish is going to utterly ignore that presentation. So really, those are your basic skills and the basic knowledge of approaching the river. We're going to get down to the river and start fishing rivers in a second and just show you a few things about how to fish a river, the most successful techniques for fishing a river. But just before you dive into the river and go in and scare some fish, let's take a little look at how you approach the river and how to get the benefit of catching as many fish as you possibly can. So you finally get to the river. You drive up to the river or you walk up to the river and you go, ah, there's the river, I'm gonna go fishing. Well, let me give you a couple of quick little tips that really will help you catch more fish. And the first tip of that is don't do what every single Tom, Dick and Harry does. If you just park the car, walk to the river and start fishing that lovely looking pool by the car park because everybody's done that. And those fish are worldly wise. They understand anything that can go wrong and the slightest hint of a problem and they're leaving it alone. So far better approach is to walk from the car and just walk and just walk and just walk. Walk away from where your car park is and the further you walk away from that access point, the more fish you're likely to catch because you're away from those super cautious trout. So that's one great tip. Another great tip is when you get to the lovely spot you want to fish, sit down. Sit on the bank, sit on a bench, or stand, and just watch the water. Let's say you've walked upstream and you found this gorgeous pool. Well, you don't really know exactly where the fish are or 
Are they feeding on a fly on the surface? Are they feeding underwater? Are they big? Are they little? So the next thing I would suggest you do is sit or stand and just watch the water for a little bit. Try and get a feel for what is happening. That'll give your approach much more success rate by doing that than just blundering straight in and starting fishing. And on that note, I would also make sure you, or caution you to not blunder in and start fishing. Approach the water carefully. Approach the water slowly, not a lot of fast movements. Approach the water from below the skyline. You don't want to be a silhouette on the skyline. Fish absolutely bolt the moment they see that silhouette. Walk slowly in the area where you want to fish because fast movements scare fish. Wade carefully and slowly and gently, not to create waves. And perhaps use bushes or tall grasses when you're walking along to hide you. And of course, don't wear bright color things that people and the fish can see. So take a little bit of common sense there. These are creatures that are highly instinctive about being caught and eaten. So they are ready to bolt. So you just got to approach the water really carefully. And really, you know, if you want to take this to the absolutely simplest degree, I would recommend you hire a fishing guide. Fishing guides are professionals who know the water backwards. They know where the fish are going to be. They know what the fish are going to be eating. They know the access points. So really, if you're a new fly fisher, probably your best solution is go and find a fishing guide on the water you want to fish, hire him for a day, and then let them teach you a few things that we're all showing you in this video. And that will probably give you the best chance of catching fish. So enough waffle, let's get down to the river. And for goodness sake, let's go and show you how to fly fish a river. Okay, so now that you've seen a few of the basic concepts of river fishing, how to read the river, the kind of gear you need, just a few of the basic casts, and then how to control slack, and this men thing that we looked at. All of those come together when you actually get to the river and start fishing, and that's what we're doing now. And really, when you're at the river, there's three ways to fish it. You can either swing a fly, you can drift a fly, or you can strip a fly. And those are the techniques I'm about to show you. And really, those techniques are all based on what kind of fly you fish. You can have flies called dry flies. They float. And you can have soft tackles. They don't float. You can have flies called nymphs. Generally, they don't float. They fish underwater. And you can have these things, gaudy, big, bright things like these called streamers. And these streamers fish underwater. So those are styles of flies. They all have names of the types of flies. And generally speaking, it's the type of fly that influences whether you strip it, whether you drift it, or whether you swing it. So I'm going to set up an outfit, go out on the water, and just show you some of those basic techniques. The easiest of those is the swing. Generally speaking, you're going to swing soft tackles or you can swing streamers, but the technique is called the swing. And why it's called the swing is, well, what well, happens. When you cast your line across the river and you hold it tight, the current will swing it around until it goes directly downstream. That's called the dangle. And that, that's why it's called swinging, right? Because the line swings. It's really easy technique. And why it's such an easy technique is because you can make a really bad cast and the current just washes it at straight and then your line will fish and you could get a fish that way. It's also an easy technique because your line is always tight, you will feel every single grab. So when a fish grabs the fly, you'll feel it. It's like a little electric shock down the line. And when you feel that shock, you set the hook the moment you feel something. Other techniques are visual, you have to see something. This one, it's pretty easy because you feel. So if you're taking a, a kid fly fishing or you're a complete beginner, you just want the easiest way to fish, then swinging is for you. So a couple of things to note about swinging. One, you're going to start off with a fairly short line. You find a little comfortable spot and you want to find the right type of water. And the right type of water is going to be anything from about one foot to about four foot deep. That's ideal swinging water. You don't want really fast torrential white water with big waves like that. And equally, you don't want really slow glide type water. Those don't give you good swings. You can, as you get better, fish those places. But generally speaking, you're looking for a nice, even little rolling wave, just a little bit of medium pace current, two to four foot of depth. And then the technique is you're gonna make a cast and you're gonna make your cast about 45 degrees across the current. You're gonna drop your rod tip low and as the current swings the line around, you actually swing the rod with it like this. So my rod is swinging with the line all the time. And when the swing finishes and it doesn't go any further, I'm gonna lengthen the line by about three feet. 
make another cast and just do the same thing. Men, drop my rod and just swing it around. And again, all you're waiting for is a little bang, little tug on the end of the line. And then when you get that, that tells you a fish has nibbled it. Now, the hard part is then hooking it. You have to react instantly, you feel something, with a hook set. And in this case, you always want to set the hook away from the line. My line is on my left-hand side, so my hook set, if I fell to grab now, would be immediately to my right, because that tightens the line the quickest. I wouldn't want to go to the left, because that'll give a little bit of slack and delay the hook set slightly. So that's how you set the hook. And then I'm going to lengthen the line again, about three foot, four foot more, cast it out, swing. And if you remember in the earlier episode, we were talking about the mend. Well, here, if you see that line swinging really fast, or if you're getting that drag curve we saw earlier in the studio, you're going to put a mend in to counteract that. So that mend we showed you earlier, that's really important when you're swinging. And maybe I'll lengthen the line by another two or three feet to make another cast. Maybe another little mend here. And then I've got to the length of the line where I'm really comfortable. And now, instead of lengthening the line and getting to a part where I just can't cast because it's too much line, all I'm going to do is just take a step downstream and repeat. Cast, mend if necessary, not always, but if necessary. Swing. No grab, move down, move down. And so that's how you can get in a piece of water and fish a hundred yards of it from the top to the bottom and swing from side to side, cover a huge amount of water with this great technique. So as I said, if you want the simplest, easiest way to fish a river, swing a fly on a tight line, wait for the grab, set the hook, and that's just nice and easy. Stripping, pulling the fly is what stripping is. It's a little more complicated, needs a couple more thoughts. That is what we're going to look at next. The reason stripping is a little bit more difficult than swinging is simply that you're going to be pulling the line in and, and changing your retrieve. And you've got some, something you have to do with your dominant hand, and that makes it a little bit more difficult than that swinging. Now, swinging was very easy. Cast, good or bad, swing, catch a fish. The stripping part now becomes a little bit more difficult because of this, and I'll show you why. So on the end of this, I've tied on this gigantic brown and yellow thing. It's a streamer. Who cares about the name of it at this point in time? It doesn't matter. It's got heavy lead eyes. I like the lead eyes because in the water, that thing just pulses and kicks and undulates like that. And it's very seductive. So that's a good thing for me because it's a seductive way it catches fish. And really all there is to it, to the stream of fishing, to the stripping, is you're going to cast your line out into a bit of water. You're going to drop your rod low and you're going to strip the fly in with this, this non-dominant arm. This is my left arm, so I'm going to strip the fly in with this hand here, just pulling it in. And there's a couple of things to note about that. One is that you are going to want to change up how you strip. You don't want to have a same repetitive strip the whole time. But two, and this is what makes it more difficult than swinging, is you've got to have a fairly quick reaction of what to do with the line. Once you cast your line out, you've got to put the line under this finger, that's called the stripping finger, and you want to pull the line from this finger in. Pull from the finger down like this. My rod is low, I'm stripping from my finger. That's the important part. All too many people, the first time they do it, they chuck it out and they, they pull like this and, and then they grab it up here and they pull like this. I, I, it's, I don't understand why, but a lot of people do it that way. It is hard. If you get a grab or something happens, you've just got no tension to set the hook, you'll never feel. So the hardest part really about stripping is having that presence of mind that the moment your line lands on the water, you put it under this finger and then your stripping starts. And when you talk about stripping, there's a couple of things to know. Trout love unpredictable things. Your fly is darting and jerking and moving in the water unpredictably. So what you don't tend to do with a streamer is being like boring basil and just kind of having the same strip all the time. Cast after cast. Start nodding off, a little slow soporific effect. And the fish are the same. They, they don't really like it. What you want is you want to change that streamer up. You want to get that fly moving and twitching and pulsing. And so when you do your cast and you get your line under your finger, then you might do a few short, quick retrieves and then stop, and then a slow draw, 
and a couple more quick ones and just keep changing it, particularly if you're fishing a lot of water because you want that fly to do lots of different things and one of those change ups will trigger a fish to grab it. So that's one of the parts about so the stripping is a little bit harder than swinging is this grab, the change of the strip. What you can do to improve your chances is when your fly lands is give it a little bit of a pause. So I would cast my line out like this, wait for a few seconds, that makes it sink a little bit deeper. Now I would do my change up strip. Right, you don't want to cast and strip immediately because your fly will be too shallow, you want to pause. And another good thing about stripping is you can also throw it upriver. With the swinging, we tried to deliberately target a 45 degree angle downstream. Well, with this, I would say you can also throw your line upriver and strip and strip and pause and strip and strip. So you've got a huge arc and area of water you can strip through. It can be downstream, it can be across stream, it can be upstream. But each time, remember the mend. We talked about the mend earlier in the studio. Remember the mend, if you get a lot of big, big kind of bow in the line like this, well, mend it out, get rid of the bow, get the strip, pause, give it a little slack, let it sink, all that change up. And with that in mind, you'll find that stripping, generally streamers is what you strip, stripping is a very, very successful technique. And the grabs, well, the grabs are self-evident. They are hard. You're pulling this way, the fish is pulling that way, there's a great big pull on the line. People fishing streamers for the first time think, oh my God, there's a whale just took it, it's so hard. But it's because you're pulling and the fish is pulling. And it could be a 10 inch trout, but you get that great big tug. And obviously when you feel the hook set or you feel that's bang, you set the hook same as you did with the other one, kind of a bit of a pull of the line and a, a yank away from where your fly is in the water. And generally because streamer fishing is so quick, usually you do want to think where you've got the space, you want to make long casts because the longer the distance you cast out, the more distance you'll be able to strip. Little pause, little mend, now I'm going to strip. I can cover a lot more water like that. So you can make those longer casts if you've got big enough water when stripping. And really that's all there is to strip in. As I said, generally streamers, generally you're going to feel these heavy grabs. The hardest part is getting used to this and changing up that strip, the speed of the strip. And if you do that, you'll find stripping very, very successful indeed. And the last thing we then look at here on the water is the technique of drifting. Drifting is probably the most difficult technique to master, certainly as a beginner when you don't really have much control of anything. And there's a couple of ways of drifting and that's what I'm gonna show you next. Drifting after stripping. One of the reasons drifting is hard is because you're trying to simulate a natural bug either on top of the water drifting down or maybe underwater that's being churned downstream by the current. And for that extent, you might either fish what's called a dry fly, a dry fly floats on the top of the water, or a nymph wet fly that sinks under the water. Let's take a little look at a dry fly. I've got an enormous dry fly on here. Believe it or not, there are real flies this size that you would fish as a dry fly. Um, but we've obviously put it on here to show you what it looks like and so you can see it on the water. But the first thing, about a dry fly that you need to do once you've got it rigged up is you do need to coat it in a coating, some kind of waterproofing coating. You want your dry fly to float and therefore what I've got here is just a bit of silicon stuff. I squeeze a little bit on my finger and then I just carefully work it into the feathers. And that's kind of really waterproofing. It means my fly will stay on the water floating much more often than one or two casts which will absorb water and then start to sink. So I coat the fly in floatant and that is now treated ready to go. Now you'd fish a dry fly because you see fish rising, right? With fish rising, when there's a hatch on what's called a hatch is when bugs come out of the water and they swim to the surface and then they come out of their skin from a nymph into an adult, they hatch out and that hatch is actually called a hatch. And when there's a hatch on, the flies are on the surface and the trout are feeding on these flies on the surface. And so you tend to see them you would spend a little bit of time watching water and you start to see fish rising or splashing or jumping around. And that tells you that the fish are feeding on the surface. And that tells you to fish a dry fly. And then you'd look at the water and say, oh, look at these little brown things jumping around or floating down. Let me put on a little brown thing. Or let me look at these giant brown things with a white wing that are flying and landing on the water. Let me put one of those on. Right, so at this stage, we don't need to worry about bugs and what they are. At this stage, you fish a dry fly because you see rising fish and you try and choose something that's similar to what is on the water that's being fed by the fish. That's the dry fly. 
And with all drifting, you can fish drifted upstream and you can fish drifting downstream. And if you remember what we talked about in the studio about the control of slack, either pulling in the slack or feeding out slack and also mending, those two things are most relevant right here on dry fly and, uh, and nymph fishing, anything to do with drift. So let's take a look. I'm gonna fish this dry fly upstream. And because I'm gonna fish it upstream, what's gonna happen is, as we showed you in the studio, there's gonna be, the line's gonna land on the water and it's gonna start washing towards me. So I'll pull off a bit of line. I find my target area where there's a fish feeding or where I think there's a fish feeding. I start making my cast in that general direction, lay it down, and then I'm stripping, stripping, stripping. And I'm trying to keep a tight line underneath my rod, but making sure my dry fly drifts naturally down in the water. I don't want it going faster than the bubbles. I don't want it going slower than the bubbles. I just want it going at the same speed as the bubbles. So that's achieved by casting upstream, keeping the rod low under the finger, and then stripping the line in from that finger down. That's that slack management we talked about earlier on. And it's not too bad if you cast directly up the river. If you cast directly up river, generally speaking, all you need to do is manage this slack. Strip it in at the same speed as the current's washing. Don't let a loop of slack wash below you, that kind of stuff. It gets a bit more complicated if you have to dry fly fish upstream at an angle. Because if you cast at an angle, now you're gonna to have to employ those mends as well as the control of slack that we showed you a little bit earlier on. So generally speaking, upstream, cast, retrieve, keep the line straight, watch your dry fly. With this, you don't feel anything. You're gonna see a fish boil and your dry fly will disappear or there'll be a splash or a fish's head will actually take it. And when you see that, that's when you set the hook. So this is a visual, not a feel thing. You're gonna cast wherever that fly is, you cast, and just watch, be like a hawk, just stare at that fly. And the moment there's a splash around it, you wanna set the hook. You can also fish the dry fly downstream. And the reason you fish the dry fly downstream, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is you can't get to this position. There's a fish here, but you can't get here. You can get to that position up there because, I don't know, a deep hole, a big rock or whatever. Another good reason to fish the dry fly downstream is that for me to cast to a fish upstream, if the fish is lying here, I have to cast my fly above it. I have to give the fly enough space above the fish to drift, the fish to see it, the fish to decide to take it, which means my fly line or my leader passes the fish and that can scare fish. So sometimes you'll choose to fish the dry fly downstream because you're standing this end. I would cast my fly here. I give it slack, the fly drifts over the fish but my line's above the fish, not going over it. So sometimes the choice of you, it's a particularly difficult fish to catch, is you want to fish the dry fly downstream. So let's see how we do that. The most important thing with this, as we talked about earlier on, is that the fly doesn't just sit there in the current like that. That is unnatural. Every natural insect on the water is gonna float down at the same speed as the current. So I need to make that happen. I'm gonna target the fish that I see rising, that I know is lying in that spot. And I'm gonna cast my fly two or three feet short of that fish, drop my rod with slack and just bounce slack out my rod as we showed you earlier on. And that giving slack will give your fly a, a natural drift of six or seven feet. That's perfect. As long as you cast three or four feet short of the fly and you get six or seven foot of drift, your fly will drift right over that fish and you've got every chance in the world of catching it. So those are the subtleties of the drift. You're gonna to have to manage slack if you cast at an angle to the current, you're also gonna to have to manage your mend and manage slack. See, there's me dry fly, I'm feeding slack out. It's floating away into the distance. It floated, I had a 30 foot drift then because I kept feeding slack. So those are your keys. Upstream, keep the line tight, watch your dry fly. Downstream, make sure there's enough slack so the fly can drift naturally. Watch your dry fly. When you see the fish eat it, set the hook. And that is, in a nutshell, dry fly fishing. And then the last little part we're gonna talk about here is the same type of thing, drifting upstream and downstream, but with what's called a nymph and an indicator. So in a similar vein to the dry fly, the drifting, 
we can fish a nymph and indicator. And then I'm just going to show you the rig I've set up here. I have a thing called a bobber or a strike indicator or a float, whatever you want to call it. That's attached to my leader here. There's numerous sizes, colors, versions. I've just got this one on. And then I've got about two and a half, two foot behind it. I've tied a small weighted nymph on that. And then to the bend of the hook, I've tied about 10 inches of monofill and a very small little nymph here too. That's my rig. And the reason I've set up about two and a half feet between my indicator and my first fly is that the water I'm going to be throwing it in is about two and a half feet deep. I want my fly to be close to the bottom. If I'm going to fish a pool that's like five or six feet, I'll have five or six feet gap between this indicator and this first fly. So that's the rig. It's very similar to the dry fly fishing in that you're going to be throwing upstream and retrieving. And then when it goes past you and goes downstream, you're going to be feeding slack. But unlike the dry fly, you fish the nymph indicator when you don't really know where the fish are. It catches a tremendous amount of fish. It's one of the most productive ways of fishing in terms of catching fish, but it's more difficult than the stripping of the streamers and the swinging of the soft tackles. But it's very productive. And why I say it's similar to the dry fly is because the dry fly, you've targeted fish You've cast your fly in front of a particular fish, the fly's gone over the fish, and if it hasn't taken it, you've cast it again. Here, we don't know where the fish are. We're gonna still drift a fly, but I'm just gonna drift a fly over a much greater section because I don't know where the fish are. So it's gonna combine the upstream stripping technique and the downstream feeding of slack technique all in one go and with a mend. Oh, it's putting it all together. It's the whole enchilada of everything we've talked about so far. In terms of the water, I'm going to try and look for, for, for channels. I'm looking for where the current is kind of filtering food. So if I see do bits of current between two rocks and it's starting to push the currents towards each other, I know that a lot of food is being funneled into that one channel. So I'm going to look for a particular channel or particular edge, what we call the seam earlier on, or the bubble line, we talked about that. Those are areas that I want to concentrate trying to cast my nymph in. And really, it's not much more complicated than that. You're gonna find the area you wanna cast. I'm just gonna chuck it over here. Not a big cast to start with. I'm gonna drop my rod, retrieve, and I'm gonna watch the indicator. And I'm gonna retrieve as long as the indicator is upstream of me. If it disappears, it's like a light bulb going out. For the first time people see it, they're seeing this indicator and then it's, where is it? Well, it's gone under, probably, because a fish has grabbed it. So when you see your indicator disappear, instantaneously set the hook. That's what you're looking for. So back to what I was saying. If I cast upstream of me, I'm gonna do drop the rod, retrieve, 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 maybe a little mend, but then it gets to a point where it passes me. I'm gonna mend and now it's past me. I'm gonna bump slack out and continue that drift all the way down. So you get the combination of that upstream and downstream. With the dry fly, we weren't doing both. As you remember, the dry fly, you're targeting a fish, so you're either choosing upstream or downstream. But generally, when you fish this nymph and indicator, you don't know where the fish are, so you want to have this whole seam covered. So as I said, we'll cast it out. Let's put it a bit more across there in that deeper water. Drop, little mend, strip, another mend. Now it's past me, I'm gonna start feeding the slack out. Feeding the slack out, and that's how you fish it. And as I said, all the time you're doing this, you're watching that indicator. Every now and then, like then, the fly will snag a rock and the indicator will disappear, but you still set the hook. You just never don't set the hook. The moment an indicator twitches, sneezes, farts, does anything, there's a movement, shimmer, set the hook. Something has made it happen, and it could have been a fish. So just always be prepared. It doesn't have to disappear, it can twitch, it can move. There's another one that further out, mend, retrieve, another mend. Now out goes the slack again. Feed, feed, feeding slack, long drift down, round the rock. So it's probably the most difficult technique of all the ones we've talked about, the stripping, the swinging, the drifting. The dry fly drifting is relatively easy because you're targeting a fish, what makes this nymph drifting one, as I said, probably the most difficult is A, you don't know where the fish are, and B, you're combining all those skills you've learned, the retrieving as it comes towards you, and then the mending and the feeding out of slack. 
But as I said, it's probably the most deadly technique of them all. You'll catch the most fish that way, most situations, across big mend. Now it's past me, feed. So that's it. Those are your basic guides to fishing river. There's a few techniques there for you to work on. There's a few ways to fish, depending on whether you want to swing, whether you want to strip, whether you want to drift. There's some terminology in there that you just got to understand. Really, I haven't gone into any details of these. These are just ways to start off a basic river fisherman on the water for the first time you approach a river, They're giving you a few tools to get out there and have the best chance of catching a fish. Talking of that, let me see if I can catch one. So the moment has arrived. You've done everything right, you've approached the river, you've got your right technique, a fish has eaten the fly, you've seen me eat, you've set the hook, and there's a fish on the end of your line. It's there. It's a great feeling. Even after catching, I don't know how many fish I've caught, I love that part when there's a fish on the end of the line. But it doesn't stop there. There's things you've got to do to make sure it stays on the line and you don't lose it and have just a story. So we're going to look at Tommy. Tommy's back in the water again, he's fishing his line, he's casting upstream, a fish has eaten it, he's got a fish on the end of the line, and there's a couple of things you've got to do. The first thing is you want to make sure it's a kind of a give and take type of thing. If you pull and the fish pulls at the same time, those two opposite forces will do one of two things. Either snap the line and you'll lose the fly and the fish, or you tear the hook out of the fish's mouth because there's too much strain on it. So it's a give and take. If you feel the fish is pulling, basically you want to release the tension from under your finger and just let line slide out. Let the fish have the line. And then when you feel it stop pulling, you start line pulling the fish back towards you. Give and take. And what aids that is your rod position. You want to make sure your rod is nice and high. Fly rods are lovely, long, flexible wands. There's a lot of sponginess in them. And those, that sponginess, if your rod is high, absorbs the shock of any sudden move the fish can take. So you do want to make sure your rod is always raised high as you're playing a fish. Now, in an ideal world, you do want the fly and the fish to be upstream of you so that the fish swims against the current and you pull it with the current. That's a nice, easy thing for you. But sometimes it doesn't work out. And what you can see here is Tommy's fish has swum below him. Tommy's fish is right there in that fast current. And when it's in fast current, that's a hard time to get the fish. So the right thing to do is pull the fish into the slower water. Here you can see he's pulled the fly into that, sorry, pulled that fish into that slower water close to him. And now there's a lot less strain on him pulling the fish towards you. And so he can land that fish a bit easier. So that's the thing, you keep with that give and take. The fish might pull a bit more, let it out. It might not pull, pull it in. And gradually you're working the fish closer and closer to the net and you're about to get to the position where you've got the fish towards you. Now a lot of beginners at this stage keep pulling and they pull the fish until it's inches away from the tip of the rod. And there is no way you can net that. So a really good tip is to make sure that when you pull in, you keep all your leader outside the rod. That's as close as you want it. And then, once you've got the fish on the end of the line and the fish is kind of tired enough to net and the leader's outside the rod, you unhook your net, you grab your net, you put your net underwater, you crouch low and you simply raise the rod and just pull the rod vertically over your shoulder, dragging the fish upstream towards you until you can scoop it up in the net. And yes, success, I've got that fish. That's the right way to play a fish. So let it run when it runs, keep a high rod, Give and take, gradually get the fish closer towards you, get your net underwater, drag the fish over the net, lift it up, and bingo, you've got yourself a fish. And if it's your first one, congratulations. Wonderful experience will live you with you for your life. Now, once you've got it, you've got to decide what to do. Fly fishermen, a lot of fly fishermen do what's called catch and release. They marvel at this fish, they look at the beauty of the fish, unhook the fish and slip it back into the water and let it go. Some people want to keep the fish and bang it on the head and have it for dinner whatever you do, but if you're going to put the fish back, you've got to put the fish back correctly. What that means is, generally you want to fish a barbless hook, you want to unhook the fish with a fish in the water or very, very close to the water. If you lift the fish out of the water at all for photos to show your friend, hold it gently under the belly, lift it up, make sure water is dripping off that fish all the time, that means there's enough water. If the drips start to slow down, Give it a drink, let wet the fish again. And then once you've unhooked the fish, one really important tip is to make sure you let the fish go facing into the current 
Otherwise, it, if it's exhausted, it can drown facing the wrong way. So push the fish into the current, put your hand under water and just gently tip your hand up and let the fish slide out of your hand and swim away to live to fight another day. And congratulations on landing that fish because they're beautiful things. So there you have it, the basics of fly fishing for trout in a river. River trout fly fishing isn't hard once you know where trout lie, what their behavior is, and you've got a clue for two or three different techniques for fishing rivers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned a little bit about fly fishing for trout in the rivers. And if you enjoyed it, check out our next episode, which is the basics of fly fishing for trout in a lake. And as always, when you're out there on the water, remember, respect the environment. Don't leave a trace of where you've been. And above all, look after those beautiful fish you're catching. They are gems, something to really treasure. So look after those things. Many thanks for watching. Hope to see you out on the river one day. Mm -hmm.